Hi, I am Connie Ray, and I am excited to moderate our sixth episode of Talk It Out Tuesday, a weekly interview series with Crisis Support Services of Nevada, partnering with experts to dive into some of the most current issues concerning families in crisis during the COVID-19 pandemic. And in this episode of Talk It Out Tuesday, we are discussing how the impact of this pandemic has raised some new concerns for our veteran populations and also heightened some existing issues. I think it's wonderful that we are sharing this episode just the day after Memorial Day. And again, we do want to say to the brave men and women who serve our country and to our veterans, we want you to know that we greatly appreciate your service. You are a vital part of this community and your mental health is our top priority. We are so, so thankful for each and every one of you and this episode is dedicated to you. And with us today to give us some insight into this topic is Chris Jackamick. Chris is recently retired from the United States Air Force where he served in multiple leadership roles. He is a veteran of the war in Afghanistan, and he is a vocal advocate for improved mental health resources among service members, veterans, and their families. Chris serves as a care group facilitator and a peer mentor for the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors. As a wounded warrior himself, Chris has dedicated his life to finding and utilizing multiple pathways to recovery from mental health issues, including grief and trauma. And finally, he is the key advisor to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administrators, Governors, and Mayors Challenge teams to prevent suicide among service members, veterans, and their families here in the state of Nevada. And then, of course, the lovely executive director of our wonderful people that create this show. It is the Crisis Support Services of Nevada. Thank you so much to Rochelle Pellisier for being here as well. Thank you both. Chris, we'll start with you. I know that you are very aware and concerned about the care and safety of our veterans. And in fact, in July of 2017, you lost your brother, Lance Corporal Adam Jackamick. He is United States Marine Corps to suicide. He had fought a very courageous battle against PTSD. And it's quite interesting that I'm talking with you today as today would have been my daughter's 26th birthday. And on August 10th of 2018, Katie Seiler took her own life and she too was a Marine Corps veteran. So this has a very special meaning for me today to be interviewing and talking with you and Rochelle. So I thank you both so much for, for being here. This is a, a photograph of myself, uh, my, my brother Adam and my, uh, my younger cousin. My brother and I both served on active duty. We were called up to his school to bring a hero to school and have a discussion there. So this is one of the few photos that my brother and I have in uniform together when we were both serving on active duty. My brother uh, is forever, forever 34. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is Katie and her husband Sloan and this is their wedding photo. Would have been 26 today. <laughs> We miss her every day. But I want anyone who is watching this to know that you 100% matter and that you are important to every one of us. You have served this country and you are an absolute hero. And it's okay if you need help. It's okay to not be okay because you have a world that is here to support and lift you up. And if there is anything I could have told Katie, it was that there was always someone there. And if we can learn anything from the tragedy that our family has experienced, it's that we can stop suicide. We can educate, we can teach, and we can be there for one another. I'd like to start by asking you, can you help us understand what new issues our veteran population is facing during this pandemic and what existing concerns are becoming even more of a greater issue to our veterans? Connie, I sure can. And uh, I'm honored to be holding space today uh, with you the day after Memorial Day for our loved ones. Uh, for us, uh, every day is Memorial Day. It's just not a mark on the calendar. And I think in this current state of pandemic is we've got some, we've got several conversations that we can have amongst the veteran sphere. First off is we're seeing in some of the breaking news in the national news organizations that there've been over a thousand veteran deaths related to COVID-19. 
Now this doesn't account for the myriad of deaths that's occurring in some of these state-run veteran homes that are out there. This is not too much different than veteran suicide is being reported, is the numbers are there. The numbers are a little bit misleading depending on what source that you're going to and how they're accurately counted. At least for veteran suicides, we know is there are veterans out there that just do not identify as veterans. Uh, and maybe the better question is to ask is, have you ever served in the armed forces of the United States? So that way we can properly identify and, and link uh, veterans up with, with resources. But here's the thing where it comes to COVID-19 that I think we're seeing. This pandemic itself creates at least three conditions for not only veterans, but for the general public. Uh, for my brothers and sisters in arms, we have this emergent trauma. Everybody that's going through this lockdown or these social distancing, or perhaps the better term is physical distance condition, is some emergent trauma, which then it creates some loneliness due to the social isolation. And then in that as well, too, there's this un unplanned or wage loss among our veteran community that even our regular community is experienced, too. And with that, these could culminate in some sort of a, a perfect storm that's threatening mental health of many veterans. And, and for us as veterans is, is whether combat or not or in garrison and no matter what the mission is, is the importance of that is mental health has always been a challenge for veterans uh, because of the stigma and shame associated with seeking help is it's not part of the warrior motif or, or that is to be vulnerable and discuss this. So veterans are experiencing, you know, a lot of this health anxiety due to that. But, but here too, is we know that this virus attacks the lungs and everything. For a lot of the veterans out there, we're concerned about what we were exposed to in combat that may be uh, giving us some concerns with that. And I think some of these challenges differ depending on the era that the veteran served in. Um, for example, me as a post 9-11 veteran is I see this as there's a lot of supports that we have around our generation um, after that. And it ties into some of these socioeconomic needs is, is for, for us is there's that need to feel like we're giving back to another mission, to find that connectedness, to, to find that, that job, that next mission uh, per se. And there's some wonderful organizations that go out there and do that. But I think of the, my older veterans that are out there, uh, Gulf War, Vietnam, and Korean veterans, like what are they missing during this time frame? Because a lot of these services that we had built up, some of these national veteran services organizations and the VA themselves, our older veterans may not be as adept to getting with technology that they need to. So they use places such as the VA hospital or the, the base clinic down here at Nellis Air Force Base to kind of reconnect with their peers and to get into that great period in life that they remember where they felt like the mission that they had in their life at the time was a little bit greater than what they may be serving right now. A later on and earlier in the month back in May is the Bob Woodruff Foundation identified Nevada as a significant outlier for recovery. So some of these national organizations that serve veterans and entities that fund them should consider targeted support to areas that are most likely to be affected with a significant share in number of veterans. And in that study, they specifically named the Reno and the Las Vegas areas because of the economic hit that we have here. While we have great services here, is Nevada seems to be ranked at the bottom for mental health support services and traditionally has been. So, but we have a large number of veterans too. Almost one fifth of the state uh, is considered a veteran here. So with the way the economic crisis has hit the casino, hotel and entertainment industry, that employs a lot of veterans across our state. So the mix of the financial crisis uh, with the mix of the limited mental health resources and the funding sources for that uh, create this sort of perfect storm here in our own state. And then two, I, I think a discussion that's worth having uh, on a levels is there's upcoming challenges that could eliminate a landscape of organizations that serve veterans. A lot of the smaller nonprofits that rely on a lot of grant funding from both the federal government and the state that really knows the local landscape better than some making decisions in Washington, D.C. We notice a significant concern here is when I would utilize appointments at the VA hospital down here in Las Vegas and, and visit some of the other facilities across the state, you know, I, I could tell that veterans were there for more than healthcare. They were coming to connect with their peers and feel like that they were connected to a greater cause from that. And then with the inability to go to those physical gathering places for your medical appointments that you have maybe waited a month or two or you drove from some of our frontier and our rural communities to get to, such as, you know, driving down from Tonopah, or you're driving from Fallon or, or Eli or somewhere else to get some of these specialty cares is you're staying there to connect with your brothers and sisters. And I think we're missing that here in the state of Nevada for some of our older veterans.
I think that's fascinating. Do you think there is something more that we can do for those older veterans to help them feel more socially involved? We've all gotten really good at using technology, and I think sometimes we forget that there's a certain population that hasn't jumped on that bandwagon. So do you see focus from the VA or any of the, the vet communities for the, the Korean and the, quite frankly, the World War veterans? There's still some of those out there too. The older veterans, they may not own a laptop. They may not own a smartphone that even has the capability to do telehealth. Yes, there can be some discussions on mental health over a, a traditional telephone. So we need to focus on what's the preferred method of communication uh, for this, this demographic. It may be the traditional, you know, pick up the old telephone and actually call somebody. You know, don't send a text. Don't send a, a message on Facebook or Instagram. Is Find me a World War II veteran that has TikTok and, and we'll, we'll, we'll be talking there. But, but I think it's we need to communicate with them in the ways that they prefer to be uh, communicate with. And I think the other guilty thing that we tend to do, and I see this across other nonprofits and other gathering organizations, is we expect the customer to come to them. So why don't we flip the focus? And if you have the ability to do it correctly through safe social distancing and these physical distancing practices, why don't you go to the veterans? Chris, as a veteran yourself who has struggled with mental health issues, what resources are you taking advantage of right now? And what would you suggest other veterans do if they are currently feeling the weight of this pandemic and are struggling themselves? Thanks for that question. I, I think there's some things and there's some services out there that uh, many of our veteran community may not know about. Uh, and, and this is a service that, that's hosted, uh, we've got three of them across the state and they're called the Vet Center. And, and what the Vet Center does is it's, uh, it's transitional counseling. Uh, and what they can do there is, is everybody that works on staff is a veteran themselves and is either a licensed clinical social worker or a mental health technician. And, and what I like about them is, is they're one of the few organizations that you can still go see somebody physically face to face right now, regardless of era that you served and regardless of type of discharge. And I think that's very important to, to state. So we've got a lot of veterans out there that are not allowed benefits uh, per se because of the type of discharge that they've had from the military. We have two down here in the south. We have one in Henderson and we have one on the west side of town and then there's a vet center in Reno. I use the vet center for that. Not only the counseling there, but then they set up programs that are allowed to bring veterans together. Whether you like to play video games or whether you like to fish or you like to play and discuss Dungeons and Dragons, they even have a Dungeons and Dragons group that's there but they also allow family members to come in and the caregivers of said veterans to get counseling as well too. Because we know veterans families sacrifice a lot and then there has to be this support that we build up in sort of like, I would say this, this Al-Anon Alcoholics Anonymous model just to kind of think about it to where there's the supports for the families, but then there's also the supports for the, somebody that's struggling as well too. So that's one of the uh, many resources that, that I like using. Just want to remind everyone that families are very important. You as the family member of a veteran or an active service personnel are really important to the health and the livelihood of that vet. And you too need services and need help to get through both everyday life and with a pandemic, I would say it's probably twice as hard to seek those services and to help your loved one. You know, and Rochelle, I like what you really said there because my experience while serving on active duty here in the state of Nevada is I was part of a unit to where I got to know the families better than I got to know some of my military members just because of the deployment cycle. So that, that rings true is, is you know, when, when America's sons and daughters are off at the war, it's the families are the warriors that we need to be supporting. And sometimes they get, they get forgotten about to where nothing ever is going to, good is going to happen per se when, when your loved one is downrange is that's when the things kind of like fall apart to where it's just as simple as maybe getting a power of attorney signed by a legal advisor to be able to do some things to your home or, or find appropriate childcare for your children or what's going on with school to get the proper resources. And, you know, I think there's a great blend on there to where you said it appropriately is it doesn't always have to wait until the crisis. 
And I think that's a little bit misnomer for, for your name there. It's like Crisis Support Services Nevada. It's like, don't be afraid to pick up that phone and make that call because what, what I like about you and I've, I've used you personally in, in some cases is, is linking to the resources that you may not know about that's in your community. You know, we think of crisis support services and we tend to stigmatize it in itself to just mental health, but a financial concern can be a crisis. Uh, food on the table can be a crisis. Finding appropriate childcare can be a crisis. And I don't think we have that discussion enough to where, like, let's leverage this is, sure, I could go on Google and trying to find something, but let me connect with somebody who's trained and may know the resources better in my local community than a simple Google search. And I think um, with that, even through your trained counselors there, is we can find not just a resource, but the appropriate resource that meets that family's needs. Just in my experience, especially after losing my daughter, to know that the military's culture is shifting and you see a true dedication to understanding that there is a mental health component. So I do feel that there are things that the military and the VA are doing that are right. And I'm wondering, Chris, if you might be able to highlight some of the right things that the military and the VA are doing right now. And then what are you seeing in the gaps and how are they making those adjustments to fill those gaps during this time of crisis? I think the VA gets a bad rap because the qual once I, once you get through kind of the administrative side of it, the quality of care uh, is really there. So out, out of anybody, out of any organization, especially here in Nevada, like the VA hospitals are really equipped to this transition to telehealth. I've been having physical therapy appointments over telehealth and it's phenomenal with the technology that they can do. I think our civilian counterparts should be a little bit of jealous about the services that we're able to get through there. I had a PCM appointment, like they could look in my ears and see what was going on. I could open my mouth and they take my temperature over the computer uh, and provide resources and everything like that. You know, within the military is we've got this community that, that bridges together. And a lot of these uh, holistic services that are, are coming together to more beyond the mental health is we really do focus on the physical aspect, the social aspect, the, the spiritual aspect of, uh, of wellness. And I think, you know, it's, uh, we have this discussion, it's more than just a public health model, is there's multiple domains to wellness. And, and through that too, so these education pieces or these programs that are built out there that discuss uh, breath work, talking about becoming your best self, some of these spiritual connections that you have there, and then innov innovative ways to be uh, socially connected but physically distanced to still accomplish the mission. You know, and there's some of them that are doing real great out there. And I, some I'd like to point out would be, as surviving family members, we know about the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors. Well, they're kind of a, a national expert through their Hope and Healing Center on grief, trauma, and post-traumatic growth. And in this time of crisis is they've opened up their resources to the entire nation through what they're calling the TAPS Together program, to where you get subject matter experts uh, that are out there that can discuss, you know, this is trauma, this is grief that you're feeling. Offer the educational supports that are needed and, and the links to other resources that, uh, that are in the community. Uh, and they're putting out message traffic of the TAPS daily program on like, what, hey, here's the news, here's some other resources that, that you can think of that are out there. So that, that's what I'm seeing a little bit in the community as well too, along with some other education pieces. And I know uh, with our work together with the, the SAMHSA teams that are out here for the mayor's and governor's challenges, we know of Psych Armor. And we know of them is, you know, if we want to do something and really understand what's in the veteran sphere right now, there's a course that you can take for free. Uh, you don't have to be a veteran to take it. You don't have to be a veteran's family member to take it. Uh, the general public can get online. And you, there's 15 things, there's a course on there called 15 Things Every Veteran Wants Should You Know. And that's kind of a, a good introductory course to a, a military 101 if you don't have anybody that's been serving to understand the differences between the branches of service. And then they also have a, a suicide prevention class on there called SAVE that really discusses the warning signs, the symptoms, and the conditions of, a, of, of, of suicide just in general, not just for veteran sphere, uh, even with the acronym. So I, I think that's good and that's a step in the good direction. Uh, there's, there's some things that are concerning out there is the continued talk that this pandemic may increase the suicide rates. Well, some of that numbers are speculative as we just don't quite see it yet. Could there be, yes, uh, we know, we know that financial crises uh, can cause a lot of mental health and anxiety concerns. We know that 
uh, isolation does cause a lot of concerns. And I think we need to be cautious with saying that because in some regards, um, some of the slowdown could actually be beneficial for mental health. You're exactly right about the positives. Some people are reaching out. It's not everyone who is in a suicidal crisis. And it doesn't mean just because we have a pandemic going on that all veterans, as you talked about, are going to be driven to a suicidal crisis. What we're doing much better across the board, in my estimation, is getting the word out on how to get help, how to help yourself, and then how to, to reach out and get that help. And those are suicide prevention techniques that we kind of take for granted, but we're putting it out there and, and people are, are understanding that, yes, I can reach out. We're making this, we're, we're normalizing our conversation around mental health, and I'm going to reach out and get that help and not not look at going into an added crisis of, oh no, the sky is falling and now it's going to drive up suicide. And that's across the board. And I, I think getting that word out, it, just like we're doing right now. In fact, that's why we do talk it out Tuesdays for exactly that reason, to normalize these feelings and also to get the word out about how to address them. For my veteran brothers and sisters out there, don't be afraid to reach in. Call that battle buddy or that veteran you haven't talked to in a long time from your unit. Rekindle some, some of the good times that you had together. Uh, even just as simple as a text message, or if you can, uh, in some regards, write them a handwritten letter. Just the fact that stating that you're there, I care about you, I care about our shared experience, is that may be more to say, okay, now I'm gonna reach out and get the help that I need. So reaching in, to those that you even think may be struggling um, is just as good. And, you know, not just to say, uh, you know, reach out, reach out to your friends who may be struggling, you know, uh, uh, reach out to your strong friends as well too, that, that kind of give that perception that uh, they've got everything together. Cause uh, nine times out of 10, they don't. And they're looking for that help as well too. I again want to thank you both for being here today. Uh, again, just a day after Memorial day, this is a very, very powerful, uh, and poignant episode. And I'm so gracious to you, Chris, for sharing your story. I absolutely hate that we share the bond that we share, but I also feel like because we are able to speak out, we will make a difference. And we want every veteran and every service man and woman to know that they are loved, they are appreciated, and that there is always someone that is listening. And of course, you can contact an individual at Crisis Support Services 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and you can contact them by calling 1-800-273-8255. You can also text CARE to 839-863, or again, visit their website at cssnv.org. Let me just throw in there, the VA hotline you call the exact same number, you just push one. So if you'd rather get to a peer, just push one and you'll get to the VA hotline. And again, I do wanna say that Crisis Support Services of Nevada is a nonprofit organization and we would absolutely love your support. Again, a nonprofit organization, you can make a donation and keep in mind that it's not just all of Nevadans that Crisis Support Services is helping. They help people across our nation. So if you would consider making a donation, please visit their website. Again, that's cssnv.org. And again, we look forward to being with you again next Tuesday for another episode of Talk It Out Tuesday. And again, thank you so much for supporting Crisis Support Services of Nevada.